Dr. Aaron Haug is a neurologist and movement disorder specialist practicing in Denver, Colorado at Blue Sky Neurology. He is interested in medical and surgical treatments for the motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. He is involved in patient education through a variety of advocacy groups, including the Parkinson's Association of the Rockies. Outside the office, he likes to spend time with his family, play ultimate Frisbee and follow Kansas Jayhawks basketball. I know there's some Kansas people here and Colorado's Colorado Rockies baseball. Um, that was kind of a tongue twister. Uh, so hopefully they will actually get to play this year. We don't know about that, but um, excellent. Thank you so much for being here. We're excited to have you. I'm going to turn myself out. Well, actually, let's see if we can get your uh, PowerPoint up before I take off. All right. So, well, rock thank you chalk. so much for that introduction. Oh, rock chalk. Yeah. Uh, all right. So share my screen. This one. And then All right. this mode. Okay. All right, cool. Well, Mel, thank you so much for leading us through that exercise break. I was going to do it if, uh, if it didn't happen otherwise, but I, I think it's much better to uh, have someone who was a former professional as an aerobic instructor guide us through that. Uh, well, I agree with Dr. Hamilton. It's going to be a little bit unusual to not be able to see you guys. So I've made some uh, some slight representations of just a few of the hundreds of you that are, have joined us this morning. So it's my honor to be here. And we'll be talking uh, now about not just the shakes, non-motor symptoms and Parkinson's. I think this is going to dovetail really nicely with some of the things that Dr. Hamilton was just discussing. Uh, I sometimes have slides on some of those same topics, but I've kind of slimmed down my portions related to movement, uh, related to uh, mood and cognition, and I'm focusing on some of the other non-motor symptoms. So here we go. So when we talk about non-motor symptoms, I like to sort of break them into a few basic categories. The first category is autonomic symptoms. We'll talk about what that means, but these are a lot of responses that the body has that happen automatically. Sleep, Dr. Hamilton touched on some of these issues and I'll delve into it in a little bit more depth, but there are a number of issues related to sleep that can particularly affect people with Parkinson's. And I think we can all appreciate how much better we feel after a good night's sleep. So mood and thinking, I kind of mentioned that here just so that we reiterate that it fits within this framework of non-motor symptoms. Uh, but Dr. Hamilton has covered that beautifully. And then we'll talk about a few other important things that don't uh, fit neatly into one single category. So as was mentioned earlier, not everyone will have all symptoms. It can be overwhelming to have a couple of talks like this where we talk about some of the things that can happen. And it's not so much that we're trying to create a checklist of trouble to go looking for, but it's more that if you realize this is something that you are already experiencing, that identification and treatment can improve your quality of life. So yes, I am a Colorado Rockies fan and I'm sad that uh, we haven't had any baseball yet, but hopefully sometime in the coming months we will. And so here's a quote from the late great Yogi Berra who says, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And I think that that applies to many aspects of Parkinson's. So all these people uh, really seem to have it together and I still have no idea what's going on. Maybe it doesn't feel quite as much like that since we're each in the comfort of our own home. If we were in a big uh, auditorium hall, maybe it's easy to think, oh, people on the outside look so calm, cool, and collected. But I think a lot of us can actually feel this way. And hopefully by the end of this morning and by the end of this talk, you'll feel a little bit less like this. So managing non-motor symptoms. I'm gonna kind of highlight a few action items as we go through the talk. And so commit to exercise, whether that's going for a walk, finding a class, joining a gym. I'll talk about a number of ways that this can improve non-motor symptoms. Update your medication list and keep it with you all the time. 
uh, in case something happens or in case you're seeing a new medical provider who you thought maybe should have your medication list, didn't they fax that over? Uh, but maybe uh, they don't have it up to date. Connect with your Parkinson's community through a digital forum like this, through a lot of the things that Dr. Hamilton mentioned. I think that this is uh, going to take a little extra effort during this time of physical distancing, but it's well worth the effort. And then recognize at least one non-motor symptom to discuss with your physician. So I'll put these little yellow asterisks on the slides uh, as we go along, which indicate ways in which these action steps apply. So this is uh, one of my patients who came in a year or two ago uh, wearing this shirt. Uh, as Dr. Hamilton mentioned, part of the reason that we're all involved with the Davis Finney Foundation is because we're all such strong advocates of exercise. And just uh, a little tongue in cheek, he said, exercise, I thought you said extra fries. I don't know if you had that custom screen printed or if you can actually buy that, uh, but I appreciated the joke. Okay, so we'll get into talking about autonomic symptoms. So the autonomic nervous system controls a number of automatic behaviors uh, that the body does without really our volitional control of them. So the autonomic nervous system controls a number of bodily functions, including digestion, bladder control, blood pressure, and we'll talk about each of these in turn. So this is kind of a, a cartoon schematic of the many aspects of the autonomic nervous system and just goes to show that it can really affect things from head to toe. So let's start out by talking about constipation. I put this at the front because this is a nearly universal symptom among people with Parkinson's. It is partly just part of the disease for many people and some people also feel like their medications uh, can exacerbate this issue, but some studies show that up to 98% of people with Parkinson's can have constipation, ranging from mildly bothersome to potentially even sometimes one of the most bothersome symptoms. So it's extremely common and it can be defined in a number of different ways. I've talked to some people who say, oh no, I'm not constipated. I just have a bowel movement about once a week or so. Uh, which uh, I, I might argue is uh, something that would qualify as constipation. So it might mean having three or fewer bowel movements per week or having to strain significantly with bowel movements or feeling like you're not emptying all the way. So what are some solutions to dealing with constipation? Well, exercise. There's, it's well known that the more physically active you are, it stimulates not just your muscles, but also your insides and helps to keep your bowels moving. It's important to stay well hydrated. I'll mention this in a couple of contexts, but drinking at least six to eight, eight ounce glasses of water per day, or if you have a, a larger water container, like one of those one liter Nalgene bottles, then it's shooting for two of those per day. Uh, because that just helps uh, with constipation as well as a couple of other issues we'll talk about. And there's another trick that is drinking something warm in the morning. It doesn't have to be coffee or caffeinated, although that's kind of a, a classic example, but there's something about warm liquid that kind of wakes up your GI system and can be helpful with constipation. So some other solutions, uh, since I'm giving this from uh, the comfort of home, I was able to have my usual bowl of mini wheats this morning, which a lot of times they don't have in, in hotels. So on my way to my 30 plus grams of fiber for the day. Uh, an interesting one is sugar-free gum. Uh, and the reason that this can be helpful is that there are sugar alcohols in sugar-free gum, which can have a stimulating effect on the gut. Uh, the same is true for sugar-free candy. I keep uh, Lifesavers, mint Lifesavers on my desk at work and uh, I bought them on Amazon in kind of a, a bulk quantity and one of the comments was, these are delicious but after about six of them I felt like I was ready for my colonoscopy. Uh, so that can potentially be helpful if constipation is an issue that you're dealing with. And then there are medication options for constipation. Some of these are over the counter and can be managed independently, starting with stool softeners, potentially using laxatives, 
I would say do this with the guidance of your physician, but be aware that although most laxatives will say, don't take this more than a few days in a row without guidance of your physician, there are some people with Parkinson's who just need the assistance of a laxative even on an everyday basis, potentially over the long term. And then there are also some prescription medications that can be helpful for constipation as well. Uh, so moving from a lower part of the gut system to the upper part of the gut system, drooling is a problem that can be uh, bothersome for some people with Parkinson's. And the reason that some people with Parkinson's have this issue is that swallowing happens less often. So swallowing is normally an automatic movement, but like so many of the bodily movements in Parkinson's that may become uh, smaller in amplitude or less frequent, that is also true of swallowing. And so to treat uh, this decrease, this increase in saliva that's prompted by a decrease in swallowing, we can either trigger more swallowing or we can try to decrease the production of saliva. And so here's where the sugar-free gum or hard candy makes another appearance. Just keeping something in your mouth can trigger you to swallow more often. And this is kind of the nickel and dime solution if drooling is a problem for you. And then there are also some prescription medications that can be helpful. Some of these are uh, tablets that have so-called anticholinergic effects that make your body produce less saliva. I use those somewhat rarely because they can have cognitive side effects. Some of the other tools in the toolbox, so to speak, are that there are certain prescription eye drops that can be placed instead of in the eye under the tongue with the guidance of your uh, provider, maybe your movement disorder specialist would be most familiar with this trick that can help to dry up the mouth for a couple of hours at a time. And then Botox injections. Botox is famous for its effect for wrinkles, but it does have actual medical purposes as well. And one of the ways it is sometimes used for for people with Parkinson's is that going into your provider every few months and getting injections in your saliva glands there and there can really help to significantly reduce your uh, salivation for several months at a time uh, and usually without causing excessive or bothersome dry mouth. So another part of the autonomic nervous system uh, is the bladder. And the bladder is basically a muscular ball. And what happens to the bladder sometimes as part of Parkinson's is that that ball of muscle starts to kind of take on a mind of its own and it can contract involuntarily, it can contract suddenly, which can cause sensations of needing to urinate frequently or needing to urinate suddenly. So occasionally there are non-prescription medications that can have some benefit both for men and women. Kegel exercises are potentially helpful for putting, putting somewhat of a, a lid on this, but then there are also a host of prescription medications that can help to calm that bladder muscle down so that it's not hyperactive and not causing these spasms uh, that can cause these bothersome symptoms. So another autonomic issue is orthostatic hypotension. And this is a kind of big, complicated uh, sounding term that basically means your blood pressure drops when you stand up or when you change positions. And uh, I like to think uh, of this in terms of, think of your entire body as a, a column of water. And if you're lying down, then that column of water is horizontal and your heart has kind of an easy job. It only needs to pump blood horizontally sideways. But then when you stand up, your heart now has a harder job because it's pumping blood up and down. And the last stop on the line is your head. Uh, and if your brain isn't getting enough blood flow, then that's when you can start to feel faint or lightheaded or can even pass out, the medical word for which is syncope. Uh, and so the first step, if this is a, an issue that you're dealing with, is potentially to evaluate the use of blood pressure lowering medications that you may be using with your physician. Uh, so uh, to speak to this on the next slide here, uh, we found a bunch of these clogging your arteries. They're cholesterol pills. 
So sometimes I joke that there's no symptom that I can't make worse with medication, but we're trying to make things better. And in this example, if you're having too much low blood pressure, too much lightheadedness, but years earlier you were having high blood pressure and are still on medications for that, then sometimes some of those medications can be decreased or eliminated with the guidance of your medical provider. So what are some of the practical tips for dealing with orthostatic hypotension? Probably the most straightforward and maybe the most powerful of these is to stand up cautiously, kind of be mindful of when you stand up. For decades, we've been used to uh, being able to just pop up out of bed or pop up out of a chair, but sitting on the edge of the bed for 20 or 30 seconds when you first get up, standing up and then taking five or 10 seconds before you start to move uh, is, a, is a good practical suggestion. By that same token, many people find that if they're standing up and they kind of clench their leg muscles, that that can act as a pump and bring some of the blood from the legs uh, up into the higher parts of the body and can reduce some of the lightheadedness and faintness sensations. Uh, compression stockings can be helpful. And here in the upper picture, you see a person having the world's easiest time getting on compression stockings. Uh, I put this picture here because, oh, let's see if I can do this, slide my chair over here. So in solidarity, I actually have uh, some compression stockings on this morning, so I can appreciate how difficult it is to get these on. Uh, you now also know that I, I have pants on, which uh, may be reassuring. Uh, so compression stockings by pressing on the legs keep some of that blood from pooling in the legs, that lower part of the body that happens when you're vertical uh, column of water is uh, kind of sloshing down too low in your body. So here's the second time that I'm mentioning the importance of staying hydrated. If your body is a column of water, then it's important to have that column of water be as uh, kind of full as possible, kind of like having gas in the tank. Uh, if your physician or medical provider kind of approves it, then not only staying well hydrated, but going with kind of a, a sodium rich diet, kind of the pickles and potato chips or pickles and peanuts diet is a way for your body to retain more fluid. And this can help you to have less of these lightheadedness symptoms. And then there are also a number of prescription medications uh, that can do this same thing of either causing your body to retain more fluid or causing your blood vessels to do a little bit more of what they should naturally do which is when you change position to have those blood vessels tighten up, which is what keeps the, the blood kind of more evenly distributed from top to bottom. All right, so that was our tour of some of the autonomic symptoms that can happen in Parkinson's. And I'll move on now to talking about some of the sleep issues that can occur. So perhaps the prototypical or the most classic example of sleep issues uh, for people with or without Parkinson's is insomnia, which can mean difficulty falling asleep or difficulty staying asleep. And that's actually particularly common among people with Parkinson's. And this may be due to physical symptoms. It might be due to stiffness or difficulty repositioning. Some people have their tremor reemerge during the night but there are also hormonal changes that happen just as part of the disease that make insomnia more likely to occur. And so the treatments for insomnia, I'll talk in a minute about good sleep hygiene. There are some complementary therapies that can be helpful, uh, particularly meditation and mindfulness. I think that so many of us, when we lie down, it, our brain kind of feels like that's the time to start this record loop of just replaying everything that's happened during the day or everything that you're worried about during the future. And using meditation as a tool to kind of let those thoughts come and go rather than getting caught up in them can be quite helpful for sleep. And then supplements. Uh, I usually don't put a lot of stock in vitamins and supplements but melatonin is the body's natural sleeping hormone and it's low in people with Parkinson's. So often melatonin can be quite helpful uh, and you can use your, some guidance from your medical provider on what dose and whether that might be appropriate for you. And then prescription medications as well. Uh, some of the famous sleeping medications like uh, Ambien and Lunesta, I tend to uh, 
steer clear of in people with Parkinson's because those medications can occasionally make people even without Parkinson's do some really strange things. Like you may have heard these stories about people sleep driving where they're driving their car while they're asleep. Well, people with Parkinson's sometimes act out their dreams anyway. So if we can avoid medications that might exacerbate that, then that would be a better thing. Uh, so a medication called clonazepam is sometimes one of the first line prescription medicines for people with Parkinson's if they have insomnia. So good sleep hygiene, there's some interesting evidence that shows that if you use a consistent wake up time, not just five days a week, but seven days a week, keeping it at least within an hour on those weekend days, if you have the opportunity to sleep in, not sleeping in too late kind of helps your body clock stay on a more regulated uh, rhythm and can be helpful for then returning better sleep at night. Exercise during the day, here's that popular asterisk again for uh, the many benefits of exercise. If you exercise during the day, it's more likely you'll be able to sleep well at night. Increasing your light exposure during the day, especially during this time of physical distancing, it takes uh, some appropriate precautions to get exposure to natural sunlight, uh, but depending on the rules and regulations where you are currently, uh, wearing a mask and still getting outside to go for a walk. Uh, and hopefully after this time of physical distancing passes, uh, prioritizing that time outside so that your that natural sunlight exposure kind of helps set your body clock to be awake during the day and then helps you sleep better at night. A relaxing bedtime routine, which as uh, both Connie and Davis, as well as Dr. Hamilton were mentioning, probably includes avoiding COVID news after a certain time of day. Uh, no clock watching, this is a, a favorite one of mine. Uh, I think that sometimes we get caught up in the game of looking at the clock after we've been in bed for a while or maybe even fell asleep for a while and we're hoping maybe it's five or 6 a.m. but it's only midnight. This happened when my eight month old daughter woke up last night. Uh, I said, oh, we've got a ways to go here. Uh, but making it so that the clocks are not visible and maybe so that you don't even check the clocks at all if you wake up. If you, there's a time that you need to be awake in the morning, then have an alarm set for that time. But rather than starting the mental math of, oh, I have three hours and two minutes until my alarm clock goes off, three hours and one minute, uh, that is truly counterproductive. And so potentially not using any clocks during the night until your alarm goes off in the morning is one strategy. And then get up and try again. If you've been lying in bed for what feels like 15 or 20 minutes and it's just not happening, then get up, do something boring, maybe literally as boring as reading the phone book. And then when you start to feel sleepy, get back in bed and try again. So the corollary of insomnia is daytime sleepiness. This can be either an increased need for sleep during the day or a sudden uncontrollable need for sleep during daytime hours. Sometimes people falling asleep while they're eating or while they're in the middle of a conversation. And the treatment of daytime sleep, sleepiness is first to address insomnia if it's present. And then I think this is a point kind of well worth learning uh, or taking to heart. Some people have uh, used naps intermittently throughout their life, but I have a lot of patients who never even considered taking a nap during their 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, but now they find that their energy level is sometimes lower as they're living with Parkinson's. And I really encourage them to consider that naps or even just rest for 15 or 20 minutes once or twice as needed, kind of scheduled strategically throughout the day can be a, a useful way to recharge your batteries. I even have some patients who will nap for a couple of hours during the day, and as long as they're still able to fall asleep at night, uh, I say that that's okay. So reevaluate Parkinson's medications. Here's another one of those asterisks where having an up-to-date medication list is important because there are some medications that are more likely than others to cause excessive daytime sleepiness, particularly some of the dopamine agonists like pramipexol and ropinerol are, can sometimes be more culprit of causing sudden sleepiness uh, than some of the other Parkinson medications are. And then caffeine. Caffeine can be a, a useful medication, particularly if used early in the day. 
uh, typically trying to avoid it much after noon or one o'clock or else it can interfere with sleep at night. But using caffeine like a medication can be helpful uh, to combat some of this sleepiness. And then beyond that, there are some prescription stimulant medications that can also be considered. So let's talk about restless legs for a minute. Uh, according to some sources, restless legs is the most common movement disorder in the entire population, and people with Parkinson's are somewhat more at risk of having restless legs. I think it's maybe important to realize that there can be a couple of different things that are actually meant when people say restless legs. The technical definition of RLS is this internal uncomfortable sensation, often in the legs, uh, associated with an urge to move and, and temporary relieved by movement. But 80% of people with restless legs also have something called periodic limb movement disorder or PLMD. And these are actual involuntary jerks of the legs. And these can either happen relaxing in the evening, sitting on the couch, trying to watch television, or can happen during the first uh, 30 minutes or so of kind of light sleep where the legs will involuntarily jerk. And this can be quite disruptive both to your own sleep as well as potentially to your bed partner's sleep. The treatment of both RLS and PLMD overlap pretty strongly with the medications that are used to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So the Pramipexol and Ropinerol uh, can be helpful for restless legs. Carbidopa, levodopa can as well. And then there are a few additional treatments that can be considered if this is a significant problem. So the next sleep issue to discuss is REM sleep behavior disorder. So I mentioned that people with Parkinson's sometimes act out in their sleep, act out what they're doing in their dreams. And this can be as simple as sleep talking, uh, but it can also be sometimes punching and kicking in bed. Uh, there can even be more elaborate dream acting out that can lead to falling out of bed, where I have one patient who is a former football player who was playing football in his sleep, got up out of bed, and did a great form of tackling the running back that he was going after, but unfortunately it was his door frame and he separated his shoulder. Uh, I bring this up just to show that REM sleep behavior disorder can be quite a significant problem. So some of the solutions to dealing with REM sleep behavior disorder have to do with taking practical measures uh, to try to promote safety while you're asleep. These are things that are happening involuntarily while you're asleep. So it's not exactly something that you can just talk yourself out of doing. And so certain precautions like moving sharp objects away from the bed, patting any corners next to the bed, uh, placing a mattress or extra pillows down on the floor in case someone does fall out of bed, or likewise adding a, a bed railing to, to the side of the bed. These are all things that can help keep a person safe in bed. And then occasionally it does come to uh, such a, an extreme measure of having uh, each partner need to sleep in a separate bed. Uh, that creates a number of other issues related to, you know, potentially intimacy and the loss thereof. And so if, it's, if that's the sort of thing that's being considered, uh, then medications are certainly worth discussing with your medical provider. Uh, melatonin, which I mentioned for insomnia, clonazepam, which I mentioned for insomnia, and which can also help restless legs and periodic limb movement disorder. Uh, can Both of those, the melatonin and the clonazepam, can also be quite helpful with reducing REM sleep behavior disorder. All right, two items in the outline down. And the third one, we're actually not going to delve into in much detail uh, because Dr. Hamilton, I think, did uh, just a beautiful job of talking about the issues that can arise with depression, anxiety, and cognition, and how to deal with those. She made basically all of the same points that I tried to make during this presentation and when I'm talking with my patients. Uh, so certainly refer back to her slides uh, as a very valuable resource. Uh, so I will say that, uh, as was mentioned, depression, anxiety, and even cognition have been shown to improve with exercise. So here's another cartoon of you need more activity. Start with some light dusting of your exercise equipment. 
So our fourth category that we'll spend a few minutes on here at the end is talking about a few other important things. So here is a, a pain scale. This is called the Likert pain scale. And uh, I didn't make this up. This is really what it looks like. Uh, but you can see that some of the lower numbers, they don't really look like they're in that much discomfort. Uh, and so there was a comedy blog, this was now 10 years ago already, uh, but they went through and kind of reimagined what do these faces look more appropriate for rather than describing levels of pain, ranging from number two kind of looks like awesome, someone just offered me a free hot dog to, oh, I didn't know that about giraffes or even eight out of 10 here kind of looks more like this ice cream barely has any cookie dough in it. So pain can be a real issue in Parkinson's and I think it's often unrecognized even by neurologists. Uh, the pain that can happen in Parkinson's can sometimes occur with motor fluctuations. So if your medications are working well, the pain is maybe not an issue, but then your medication may start to wear off and then you have more achiness in your shoulders, more low back pain, maybe more cramps and muscle spasms. And these are all things that either directly or indirectly can be considered to be part of Parkinson's disease. And so here's that asterisk of making sure you have an up-to-date list of medications so that possibly adjusting your Parkinson's medication regimen uh, can be used as a strategy for treating pain symptoms that can arise trying to smooth out those motor fluctuations that may also have pain fluctuations coinciding with them. And then there are, are also prescription medications that should be considered for pain if it's a significant part of the symptom complex that you're dealing with. These may range from gabapentin, which is Neurontin, which can be useful for a variety of pains, including neuropathy, which happens to some people with Parkinson's, all the way up to uh, strong medications like opiates that can sometimes be used often with the involvement of a pain management doctor uh, as part of the, the pain treatment regimen uh, that a person with Parkinson's may require. Uh, a brief note here about melanoma. People with Parkinson's are at a higher risk of melanoma. This is separate from any medications that may be being used. It's something about the part of the brain that is affected in Parkinson's that makes dopamine, also makes melanin. And because that part of the brain is dysregulated, people with Parkinson's are at a higher risk for melanoma. So wear sunscreen, especially when you're getting that good light exposure to help with your sleep, and plan on seeing a dermatologist at least once a year for a full body skin check. Uh, impulse control disorders are one of the last points that I wanted to reiterate. Uh, sports betting was just legalized in Colorado recently. I think yesterday was the first day of it being available. And uh, I know from uh, being in the Midwest for uh, growing up that Omaha and Council Bluffs and the riverboats in Kansas City, there's pretty easy access to all of these things. Uh, and it's important to be aware, as Dr. Hamilton was saying, that certain medications, especially, again, the dopamine agonists, are more likely culprits for really ramping up this feedback loop of spending too much time and effort in things that normally are kind of fun and feel good, like gambling or sexual behavior or shopping. But if those things really go off the rails and, become it, and are becoming too much of a focus and disruptive to other aspects of your life, then this is definitely something that is worth talking to your doctor about. So to reiterate some of the action steps that I tried to highlight as we go along here, I think that committing to exercise for its various benefits on gut function and sleep uh, and mood and anxiety is one of the single most important things that any person with Parkinson's uh, can do for themselves. Keeping an updated medication list with you at all times, using forums like this to connect with your Parkinson's community, and hopefully through this talk and throughout this morning, being able to recognize at least one non-motor symptom that addressing with your physician uh, may lead to an improvement in your quality of life.